Hello. Welcome to my channel. I have three topics today that I hope are of interest to you. The first will be an update on the status of the Novavax vaccine and what we know about its release. And second, are the billions of dollars going into the pockets of vaccine producers making a difference? And last I ask, do you wonder what percentage of the U.S. population has some immunity to COVID, either from vaccine or infection? I'll try to answer that for you. But first, if you've seen my previous video, you may recall that the Novavax vaccine is a traditional vaccine instead of a messenger RNA vaccine. It still involves spike proteins, but instead of making our cells produce the protein, the vaccine contains nanoparticle clusters of spike protein fragments that stimulate the immune response. Like the Pfizer-BioNTech messenger RNA, it is dosed at a 21-day interval. If you would like more information, I'll link my other video right here. The vaccine, which will be named Covovax internationally, is still going through the expensive and time-consuming approval process. For those who are hoping for an early approval in the United States, it appears that Novavax is yet to file for emergency use authorization. However, Novavax's Indian partner, Serum Institute of India, filed for EUA with the World Health Organization in August. Approval of Covavax by the WHO would allow the company to begin distribution and administration of the vaccines in several poorer countries. That approval is expected this month. Phase 2 and 3 trials are still underway in India, including adults and children as young as 2 years of age. The current study groups in children thus far have fewer than 1,000 enrollees. Those who have watched my other videos know that I have complained about the lack of data or limited study sizes in drug studies. In a country of almost 1.4 billion people, this number of study participants seems woefully small to me. Nevertheless, Novavax hopes for approval to begin vaccinating adults in India before the end of 2021 and children in the first quarter of 2022. However, that permission will likely depend on what happens in the approval process in the U.S. Quote, We can't launch Novavax's vaccine unless we get a license to launch it. The parent American company has some issues with the U.S. FDA, which should be cleared by the end of October. We will get the license only when the company gets one from the FDA. We are trying to obtain the license ahead of the parent company, but it's an uphill task, end quote, according to Serum Institute of India Chairperson Cyrus Poonawala. Novavax expects to file for EUA for Covavax in the United Kingdom within the next few weeks, quickly followed by submissions in Australia, New Zealand, and the European Union. As previously mentioned, the company plans to file for the U.S. EUA in the fourth quarter of 2021. On a positive side, Novavax says its vaccine has shown 93% efficacy against variants of concern and variants of interest. Also, the vaccine is stable at normal refrigerator temperatures and does not require expensive storage as the mRNA vaccines do. Now second, is the massive amount of money being spent on COVID vaccines actually making an impact? There is no question that on an individual level, the immunity gained by being vaccinated reduces a person's risk of getting sick with COVID. And more than that, it reduces the risk of hospitalization and death. And even though we see that immunity is quickly waned to the point where booster doses are being encouraged, what impact is vaccination really having? When I look at the data, it is not clear that vaccination has significantly impacted the increase or decrease in COVID cases or death rates. I went to the New York Times COVID tracker. I'll leave a link in the description below. The top three most vaccinated states are Vermont, Connecticut, and Maine, with 69 to 70 percent fully vaccinated. The lowest are West Virginia, Wyoming, and Idaho, with 40 to 42 percent fully vaccinated. Let's look at them in order. Vermont had a large peak in COVID cases that surged in November last year and continued until June 2021. You'll recall that vaccinations began the end of December 2020, so other than the people in the trials, no one was fully vaccinated until the end of January. If you look at the vaccination rates and dates, you will see that a large portion of those fully vaccinated received them between January and July as the vaccines became more and more available. 
Vermont has 70% of their entire population fully vaccinated, with 95% of the high risk, 65 and up, fully vaccinated. So how did that impact their COVID cases? They still are having a large peak now, which started after a vast majority were fully vaccinated and an unknown number had natural immunity from COVID infection. You'll also notice that the current peak is just as high as the previous peak before vaccination. What about the lowest vaccinated state? Idaho has only 42% of its population fully vaccinated and 81% of those at high risk. Look at the cases. A similar large winter spike peaked in December 2020, which again was before vaccination. Now we see a late summer surge, almost as high as the pre-vaccination surge. I don't see a significant difference between the two. Next, let's look at Connecticut. They have the second highest vaccination rate in the U.S. And it's interesting, after their high winter peak, they actually had a mild August and September peak. Why were they different from Vermont? I really don't know. So the next lowest vaccination state is Wyoming, with 42% fully vaccinated and 77% of the high-risk group vaccinated. But their case rate was better after their 77% vaccination, very similar to what we saw with Connecticut. Why is that? The final pair, Maine and Idaho. If I didn't tell you which one was which, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Obviously, there are different demographics and population density varies, but I can't reconcile how we are still seeing these same waves when we are told that vaccination is the most important thing. Now, I want to show you some interesting surveillance data on the estimated seroprevalence of COVID across all regions of the U.S. This data is from the National Blood Donor Seroprevalence Survey. Over a period of one year between June and June 2020 and 2021, over 140,000 specimens from blood donations in the U.S. were tested for the presence of antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. You can see that the percent positive went from near 0% June 2020, which was before vaccines, up to an estimated 88.8% seropositive June of 2021. Remember that I showed you previously that the numbers in the greatest and least vaccinated states had shown very similar spikes in cases, hospitalization, and deaths. And this study showed an almost 90% seropositivity rate before those spikes occurred. I don't have the answer. I won't claim I do. Maybe the antibodies being generated by vaccination aren't protective against the current circulating strain. If that's the case, then why are boosters of a less than effective vaccine being given? Did the rush to get something approved interfere with the due diligence required to have an effective vaccine or vaccines? I don't have all the answers. Maybe the antibodies being generated by vaccination aren't protective against the current circulating strain. If that is the case, then why are the boosters of a less than effective vaccine being given? I don't know. I'd like to hear your thoughts though. Leave them in the comments below. Thank you for watching and helping my channel grow. And as always, stay safe and be well.